Uh, let's go ahead here, since we have been uh, talking about this throughout the entire show. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and bring our guest on. Uh, you have, if you haven't already, you should have have seen her on uh, Jimmy Kimmel. She's had an article in the uh, New York Post. And as we're recording this interview, she uh, just made an announcement on a big uh, a big to do going on in the UK that she'll tell us all about. Uh, if you've read the articles, you'll know she is a former pastor turned internet stripper slash life coach and and we are excited and pleased as pleasure to have her on ladies and gentlemen nicole mitchell nicole how are we doing hi thank you so much for having me well and thank you for taking the time to be on here uh this is this is by the way uh this is tj you're speaking with and i'm jason Hi, TJ and Jason. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> as, as we're recording this interview, uh, just saw there was kind of a, a, a big announcement for you there. You, uh, you, you got some, some big TV show on the UK that you're doing. Yes, it's their version of The Ellen Show. Um, so I'm going to be on their largest daytime television show. It's being recorded at 3.30 in the morning, Pacific Standard Time, uh, tomorrow, Friday. And next week, I'm being interviewed on Australia's iHeartRadio, and there's a bunch of other stuff coming down the pipelines, but some, those are some of the bigger ones, and I'm so excited. That is awesome. And, and yet, still, you made the time to come on our humble little show. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank they, you for having me. <laughs> well, I really mean that. No, well, thank, thank you for coming on and taking the time. It's, it's, it's definitely, definitely pretty cool having you on here. Um, let's go ahead and get started, because I'm sure, you know, from amongst our... Uh, our listener base, all all ten or twelve of them, um, probably not <laughs> not not a lot. Probably really know uh, the Nicole Mitchell story, other than just kind of the bare bones stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just kind of uh, you know, give a, give us a little introduction as to who is Nicole Mitchell. Great question. Yes. So I used to be a pastor of a mega church. I was on the pastoral team there and uh, grew up in the church. My dream was always to be a speaker of some kind. And I actually grew up in a denomination that doesn't allow women to be teachers or leaders. But in my late twenties, I got involved with this mega church that allows women to be leaders, radical concept and thrive there just because I'm a, a natural leader. And they called me out to saying, you are a theologian. You should consider going to seminary. We'd love to mentor you and have you be a possible pastor here. And that was just such an honor and privilege and joy. And so I did that, was mentored by them for years, got on their pastoral team, um, loved a lot of it. But during this process, realizing like that's not really where I fully belonged. I realized I was queer in my early 30s and I had to keep that quiet because this church was not affirming and always had this desire to express myself in certain ways, but being high up in the church leadership, I was actually very much censored about what I could say, not say, do, and not do. And through many events, decided to walk away from the church, from my leadership position, and very much follow Elsa in Frozen 2 by stepping into the unknown and seeing <laughs> where this whisper was taking me. And it led me to a really unexpected and magical place where now I'm an online stripper. And so the tag, the tagline has become from pastor to stripper and it sounds radical and it probably is, but it has been a, a process in the making for years. And now that I am here doing what I love, I am so happy. I am so grateful. There's no part of myself I have to hide and I get to make a lot of money doing it. So it's, <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. And, and and we get to tie in Disney to it too, so you know there's that. Yes, because <laughs> yeah, everybody loves Disney. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, as I was as I was reading the the the, the New York Post article, that was kind of one of the things that really, um, you know, kind of stood out. I mean, amongst amongst everything, I mean, your your story is amazing. Indeed. Um, talk 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 to us a little bit about about your awakening when you, um, you when you realized. You know that 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 you were queer and 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 this 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 whole pastor pastor life isn't going to work because yeah. you you started realizing you you are who you are. Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. It, to me, I feel like my story represents just how strong the heteronormative narrative is in our in our culture in our country, where you can be born queer but be convinced you're absolutely straight for decades. 
and not learn your own sexuality until well into adulthood. And so I didn't realize I was queer until 2016. I was married uh, to an amazing man for Mm -hmm. seven years at that point. And it hit me that I wasn't straight. And it was terrifying because so much of our identity, our life is wrapped around our identity. So I was like, what does that make me as a wife, as a mother? I have three little children. What does this mean for my my church, um, for my work? And it was a gradual realization um, over the last year before I realized I was queer. I would, little things I would hear would like resonate deeply with me and it would just sit there. And it was finally after a few of those, the coin went in the slot. So I remember one night watching Grey's Anatomy and a character on there is bisexual. And she made some comment like, I don't fall in love with genders. I fall in love with souls. And something like that I was like, oh my gosh, I so resonate with that, but didn't think too much on it. And then one time I was meeting someone, like and we were introducing ourselves. It was a queer space. And so we we're introducing ourselves according to our identity and orientation. She said, I fall in love with all kinds of beautiful people. And I was like, oh man, that like that rings true for me too. And then another time I was on the board of a director, board of directors for a queer theater company based in Minneapolis, Minnesota called um, Uprising Theater. Highly recommend checking them out. And I would go to all these queer events and theater shows and it was mostly queer people there. And one of those nights I was there again at another show and I found myself magnetically attracted to certain people in that room. And for a minute there, I thought, you know, I'm just a people lover. I love humans. Um, that's probably what it is. But then something in me deeper is like, wait a second, this isn't just, I think people are cool. This is like a magnetic attraction. Mm -hmm. Like Nicole, you're not straight. And it was just like, it, it did, it rocked my world um, because it called into question everything I had ever known. And when you've never, at this point, I had never been with a woman. So it's like, how can you know something when like you've not experienced it? But it's just like how someone knows they're straight. You just know. And looking back now, all the clues were there ever since little childhood, all these clues about girl crushes and um, uh, movie stars and performers that were women that I was obsessed with. Like I just wrote it off as like a girl thing, but it was like, no, there was like a queerness there. I just denied my whole life. And so I realized it in 2016. And for a moment there, I thought I will just take this to the grave. I look straight. I pass straight. I don't need to rock anyone's boat. Don't tell anyone, Nicole, but I'm way too authentic of a soul to keep something like that a secret and decided to like slowly come out. I first came out to my then husband who was absolutely supportive, um, close friends, close family. And then a year later I decided it's time to tell the world. And I came out publicly as queer in 2017. So when, and then it's, Brings a couple a couple of interesting questions here. Um, when you when you had you know come out, you know, kind of talking about ramifications here. Um, mm. When you said you just you know you turned around, you just you, you left the church, you know, and, and and didn't look back. I mean, was it a case of it was just a, a, a snap, you know, like I'm done, I'm out, and you didn't tell anybody in the church that you were gone, and they were kind of like wondering, you know, where the hell, where the hell did she go? Or did you, you know, was there any kind of like a two week notice she gave, or you know, how how did that work when you when you left the church, and was there, you know, was there any backlash from them as a mm-hmm. as, as a group when when you came out publicly? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I realized I was queer in 2016. And then 2017 is when I left the church. And then a few months later, I then came out publicly as queer. um, Because I didn't have to fear losing my church church position over it anymore. Um, It was a decision years in the making. Um, I had been working for years trying to climb the ladder at the church. And they gave me a lot of hoops to jump through. And they kept pushing back the finish line for me. Not for the men in the group, not for the white men in the group, but for me as a biracial, closeted queer woman, they made it harder than for anybody else. And I was determined to make it. Um, Just as a public speaker, as a leader, I just know I belong at the front. And so I kept jumping through every hoop. And just throughout the process, this is like a three-year process, they would back down on what they would promise to offer me or opportunities they said they would give me, they wouldn't give me and just kind of demoralized me over many years. Like even though they chose me, handpicked me, mentored me, um, they would communicate that I was never good enough. 
no matter what I did, I was never good enough. And finally, I called them out on it three years into this saying, hey, I just want to share my heart. Like you guys keep saying, like these opportunities are going to be mine, but you keep pushing back the finish line. No matter what I do, I can't win. And so I don't, I'm not sure what's going on behind the scenes, but I just want to let you know, for me, it, it's really hurtful. And on a church scale, it's really hurtful because you say you care about women leadership, but you keep putting men in leadership positions. And we have a very big, very diverse church. And you have a woman right here and a biracial woman, no less, who's ready and talented. And you chose me. So just want to open the doors of communication and figure out like what we can do here. And right away, one of my pastors wrote back and said, you are so ungrateful after all I've done for you. This is over. I'm done talking wow. to you. And he was my personal mentor. And he has never talked to me again since that day. Even though I emailed him, I felt horrible. And I apologized. Even though I had nothing to apologize. This is how well they groomed me. Like, apologize. Like, no, I'm not trying to be ungrateful. I'm just trying to, like, talk. And, like, please be willing to meet me for coffee. Don't write me off. And I never heard from him. Um, and then the other male pastor reached out to me saying, I'm so sorry because there's a group email. He saw that. He's like, that was inappropriate of him. That was not okay. Why don't you come in my office and talk? And so we talked and he filled me in on some of the drama that was going behind the scenes. And the fact that I'd been denied all this opportunity was not random. It was very intentional on the leadership part. And that's when I said to them, I was like, you owe me, you owe me an opportunity after all you've taken from me. And so you'll, you'll give me a week in service. Cause at this point I was on the pastoral team preaching, um, every three weeks on our Thursday night service. And I wanted a week in service because that's what they had promised me all those, all these years. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to me, but, um, they gave it to me the uh, 4th of July weekend when everyone's gone, uh, traveling. And so just little things like that, they would do to me the whole journey where they would kind of slight me, um, like, Hey, here's your opportunity, but it's kind of not what you want. And so as I prepared for this, there was a decision I I had to make, like, am I going to follow through? Am I even going to show up? Am I going to come back after this? And I wasn't sure because they had just put me through the ringer. And then that final week before my sermon, they asked me to submit my sermon, which I'm a really good writer. I make a lot of my living off writing. And when I got my sermon back, it was just torn to pieces. And I was told, you know, it's the worst sermon ever. You're the worst ever. Like, there's nothing good here. If you don't rewrite this and perfect it in three days, we're pulling you from the pulpit. So just a lot of threats and just a lot of demoralization. And so... Nothing I wrote was good enough in those three days. Everything, they would just turn away. And so I finally said, okay, apparently you know what you want me to say. So why don't you tell me what that is? And I'll sit back. And he says, okay, in the sermon, you're going to say this and this. You're not going to say this. You're definitely not going to say that because no one cares about that detail of your story. This and this and this. I wrote up a sermon. I emailed it to him. And he's like, wow, that's like the best sermon I've ever read. And I was like, no shit, because it's what you told me to write. And so (laughs) after all that happened, right? This is like just craziness. You know, you know, as you keep going through here, the decision was just, is just being made easier and easier and easier for you. Yes, (laughs) exactly. So that, so this is why when I walked away, it was like the decision had been made for me. It wasn't even like I made this radical decision. Like there was no choice but to walk away because after they had treated me, um, and then the weekend I give the sermon, the pastor is supposed to be out of town, but he rearranged his schedule to be there. Um, just so he could critique me from the audience, which he had never done with any guest speaker before. So he's sitting in the audience with the clipboard, taking notes to let me know if I'm good enough because there's three services, if I'm good enough for the first service or if he will need to pull me for the last two. Um, after I did it, I nailed it because of course I know what I'm doing. I'm really good at it. And he came up and he was like, yeah, we're going to have to pull you. And I, my heart sunk. And then he's like, just kidding. That was amazing. And I was like, Oh my God, like you cannot, you cannot do that. (laughs) Um, it was so cruel. And he was like, wow, I'm shocked you did it. And I was like, what did you think I was going to do? I've been doing this for years. Um, and so I did my next two services and, never returned. And he reached out to me later that day saying, Oh my gosh, I heard you nailed it. You hit it at the park. Let's talk about debrief it when I get back in town. And I never wrote him back. <laughs> you, just, you just said mic drop. <laughs> yes, like literally. And then but it was, it was a hard decision because I loved my community. I loved my people. I wanted to tell them why I couldn't remain, but there was no room for my voice. And right. so walking away was a really painful decision because I'd been there for seven years. I'd held their babies in nurseries. I had spoken to their youth in youth group. I had taught courses there. I was very 
intimate with that community. And so to walk away was leaving a huge part of my heart there. And my hope was that someday they would maybe learn my story and understand why. And I hope through this, these interviews that I'm doing that they'll see how much I love them. And it was really hard to walk away from them. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a question for you. How, yeah. Since you face so much trouble leaving the church, um, do you still mm-hmm. like retain your religious beliefs in the church or did you just walk away from the church and still retain your beliefs? Yeah, that's a great question, Jason. I, for about a year after that, I hopped around trying to think, you know, I need to find a career affirming church. I need to find a church where there's female pastors. And, and I tried all kinds of different denominations. And I even started a queer church with two of my queer friends because I thought maybe I just need to create one instead of trying to find the right one. And we re- I, re- I helped lead that for a year. And then eventually I just, n- none of them were a right fit. So I walked away from that. They're still running that church service. Um but yeah, I've left like all institutional beliefs and, and gatherings and it's just now I'm, like a very spiritual person. Like I've never felt more connected to God, never more in the flow than before. Um, but I had to leave a lot of my lifelong beliefs in order to find that and find myself. That's very, uh, interesting actually. Um, that you were able to like just <laughs> walk away from the church and the institution of it. That's yeah, it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's pretty fucking awesome, really. <laughs> I, uh, oh, <laughs> I don't get that too often. No, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll you're, you you're, yeah, again. you're you're talking to a couple guys that you know believe that institutions we know who they put in them, so you know, right? Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, totally. Yeah, and churches are more trouble than what they're fucking worth. So yeah, I'm proud of you for that. Keep it up. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. I wrote a whole blog series on it called goodbye, goodbye to church or goodbye to the church or something like that. Cause I just like, I kind of pro I kind of walked people through my process um, for those who were interested back then. But yeah, I've, that was 2017 and I've not been back to a, a institutional church and I'm, I'm the happiest I've ever been. And I'm, I'm really grateful. Kind of, kind of doing a one eighty here. You had made mention yes. before you, um, you know, had gone to the uh, had had gone to the the play and you know started you know taking part in queer activities, you know that type of thing. You had made mention of the fact that you had you prior to this, like you had never been with a woman or in a, a same sex mm-hmm. encounter. Mm-hmm. How awkward was the first time? Well, that's a good question. I still haven't really been with one. Like, I'm like so ready, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) If you know anyone, send them my way. Send their application to me. (laughs) Application. Dear okay. Lord, you, you turn Whoa. you turn queer and then COVID hits. Boy, that's that's a that that's yes. <laughs> that's hitting exactly. the loser lottery right there. <laughs> yes, but I did have like a makeout session with a trans person, and I had like never been happier, um, and would totally have made love to them, but they weren't ready for that, and so that was like my first queer heartbreak. Um, and then, like, I've kissed a few women, which is, like, fantastic, but nothing beyond that. And I've never dated one. Um, and so I, I'm on dating apps for the first time in my life ever. I am recently divorced. I got divorced in June. For, and my my ex-husband and I are in really good terms. We're great friends, and I'm really grateful for that. And I have women, like, I put them interested in both men and women. And it's funny, because with men, because I've been with men my whole life, I know how to work. I know how to work it. And I'm very confident. I'm badass. I know how to be sexy and fun. Like just be me. And I engage with them. You know, I go on dates with them. But when women like me back, I become like a little schoolgirl. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I, and I've literally never responded to any of the women who reached out to me. I am that terrified. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, so, that, that was answer. not the answer I was expecting whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> that was freaking hilarious, so that was great. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's pretty comical. <laughs> well, so okay, so kind of, kind of here again, veering off into into another uh, deal. As you as you've progressed forward 
and you know, kind of you know, uh, doing the research, seeing you know some of the stuff on Instagram, which by the way, amazing stuff you, you got you got up oh, there. Not just um, you know, not just the the lingerie and the and the and the, and the, the, the the stripper stuff, but also the motivational speaking and the the, the life mm-hmm. coaching. Um, which which came first? Now I know um, here again going back to some of the previous articles and interviews you've done. You know, you said you kind of at a very, very young age knew that you maybe didn't know what a stripper was, but wanted to be one. But when it came to, um, I guess, your your chosen line of work, which one came first? Oh, good question. Yeah. So I've been life coaching, officially life coaching for a few years now. But honestly, it's something I've done my entire life. I just didn't know that's what it was called. I didn't know you could make money doing it. Um, and when I did learn that I finally launched my business in 2018 and doing really well with it. And I do love that. I love that about my, my social media profiles. You'll see gorgeous photos, but I also post life changing content every day. I'm so committed to people finding who they really are, doing what they love, making a shit ton of money, being themselves that I I want to help people. So I do free content. I teach courses. I run a mastermind. People can work with me one-on-one. Um, because I'm all about people having their wildest dreams come true. And yeah, since a child, I remember watching Full House as a little girl and loving Stephanie wearing her thigh high boots and spaghetti straps and things like that. <laughs> I had always been drawn to as a kid, like belly shirts. And we're raised in like the conservative Baptist churches where like spaghetti straps are evil. Anything above the knee is evil. Thigh high boots is just asking for it. And so I learned very quickly that my what I wanted was bad. Um, who I am is wrong. And so I learned to stuff down these desires, but I would see like, I wasn't even allowed to watch many kind of movies, but if I ever got to see a movie where there was like a bit of a sexual scene or a woman dancing on a pole or on a bar top, something in me is like, I want to do that. Like I was just magnetically drawn to doing that, but again, stuffing it down. And it wasn't until, um, just about a year ago, a little over a year ago, um, my coach, my, I have a life coach and his wife does lingerie modeling. And back then she was doing implied model, implied nude. And I was drawn to it. I was like, there's a woman, she's a wife, she's a mother and she's doing this. And like, she represented to me what was possible. And so that's when I opened my only fan, only fans account, but honestly, just to like give myself a place to explore. Cause that kind of content obviously can't go on social media. And I thought, well, I'll explore it. And if people want to watch me, they can pay me, which means it's going to weed out most people. Um, so it was like my little sanctuary to practice it. And the more I did it, the more I loved it. And just like I've evolved where it's like this desire has come alive. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, I was just meant to take off my clothes. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm just meant to. And now it's this full fledged business and I love it so much. So, so it's, it's a case of, uh, at this point, you've only, you've only done it you know, as far as like online videos, you know, streaming cam, whatever on that. And you haven't actually like worked a club or anything like that. It's just been strictly the only fans. Strictly only fans. Okay. And like before I moved to California a year ago, Minnesota, and in Minnesota, I would go to a lot of like queer strip clubs and burlesque shows and um, drag shows. And whenever my friends and I would go, they would always hear me every time. Oh my God, my next lifetime, I'm doing this my next lifetime. And they're like, why not now? And I was like, are you kidding me? I'm a mom. I'm a wife. Like I, I felt like I had missed my chance. And now that we're here, like I, while I've only done it all online, I would be very open to doing it in a queer strip club. I would, I would never do a conventional strip club. Queer spaces are just so amazing. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if someday my work led me to that. So, so stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so we've kind of heard how you deal with trolls. Um, your, uh, yeah. um, your other like maybe friends or family, have they been supportive of your decisions? It's a great question. Um, considering my upbringing, uh, it's been really hard for them. And so I've lost quite a few um, family members and friends to the process, which is really hard and really sad and, but totally understandable considering what they were taught to believe and what they still hold to believe, to believe to be true today. It makes sense that what I'm doing is not okay. And so I 
am sad and, but I totally understand. Um, but even though I've lost a number of family and friends over this, I have gained the most amazing community, the most amazing friendships and souls in my life. And it's been worth it as hard as it's been. Hmm. Honest answer. (laughs) (laughs) I would would certainly hope so. (laughs) No, but (laughs) shut the fuck up, TJ. (laughs) We're we're learning so much, you know, and it's, 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 I hate to say it, but you know, thus far we've got, we've got Disney equals walk away from the church and Olsen twins equals strippers. I'm loving it. (laughs) I approve. That's not the podcast interview. (laughs) Well, we That's so good. Be, well, you know, like you say, you you you've had, you've hit the big time. You've got a couple of Jimmy Kimmel shows. You're doing the biggest show in the UK. We got to make sure that this is the one you remember. <laughs> That's the key, <laughs> you know. So I and, love it. So uh, going through it, and I and I watched a couple of the. The, the, the motivational videos and you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's amazing the positivity through, you know, through, through all, through all of this where a lot of negativity could be coming through. So my two questions, so really I got a couple questions leading up to this. Number one, where did you, how, what originated the amazing mantra of unfuck yourself? And, and number two, do you have that on a t-shirt that myself or anybody <laughs> listening would be able to, to purchase. Yeah, we need to make that happen. I have so <laughs> many quotes that my clients are like, we need a shirt of that. I'm like, we do. Um, so let's make that happen. Whoever's listening, help me figure out how to create a line of stuff to sell with my quotes. Um, we, another really popular quote in my mastermind <laughs> is watch me, bitch. Nice. Like, people who say, oh, you'll never do that. I'm like, no, watch me, bitch. I'm going to fucking rise. Um, yeah, you know, what's so funny is I, I think that actual quote, unfuck yourself came from a client I'm at, of mine where she messaged me saying, Oh my God, I just love how much you're helping me. Like you're literally helping me unfuck myself. And I was like, Oh my God, that is the name of my next course. I've, I have like eight or nine courses online and this one is called how to unfuck yourself. And it's a four module digital course teaching you how to get out of your own way, take radical responsibility and rise the fuck up. And it's one of my favorite courses. Um, and it's everything I had to do to get out of my own way and create the life of my dreams. And it's me trying to pass the the wisdom on to whoever wants it. Um, but yeah, I think like I've always been like the positive, see glass half full, trust that everything's working out for you kind of person. But for life coaching, it's so much deeper than that. It's not just having a positive attitude. It's, it's creating and choosing, intentionally choosing core beliefs. So years ago when we were broke and no matter what we did, we could not ever make more money. And we were like living off money from my parents, from my best friends. It was just incredibly humiliating of a place to be. And I, I thought I came to the conclusion, huh, we must live in a world where your dreams are actually here to be devoured because no matter how hard I try to pursue my dreams, they just get devoured. And because that was my core belief, I kept finding evidence for that. Once I like hired a life coach and started doing the inner work around my beliefs and realized there, there was a world where people believe the universe has your back. That was a radical concept to me back then. And I was like, what? There's people who believe that. And my coach is like, yeah, and once you believe that you're going to find evidence for it. So I tried it on for a size by saying, I'm just going to say the universe is a neutral place. I can't say it has my back, but I would rather believe it's neutral than it actively devouring me. And I found lots of evidence showing it is a neutral place. So then I thought, huh, what if I tried on the belief that the universe does have my back? And then I found lots of evidence having my back. And that's when I realized our beliefs create our reality. What you seek, you will find. And so much of my content online and my, my videos to help people realize that their beliefs is what's creating the reality. So let's go deeper than positive thinking. Let's go deeper than mantras. And let's actually change out your core beliefs and your life will change. Have you ever had a client that you thought or just couldn't help? Ooh, that is a good question. I've never been asked that before. Fantastic. I love when I'm asked a question I've never been asked before. We try. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. No. In fact, almost every single client I've worked with has continued to choose to work with me in one form or another. So they've either become a long-term one-on-one client or they shifted into my mastermind or they've shifted into my eternal course students where they just keep taking every course I create. 
like they kind of become like lifelong supporters and believers and they refer me like crazy. And that's why my business has done so well. I have a Facebook album called raves and reviews. That's filled with over 200 and some testimonials sharing the results my clients get. They get incredible results really fast. Um, and that's allowed more and more people to work with me because there's rapport and history and results to back up what I believe and what I represent. So yeah, no, I've never had anyone. I've never been able to help. No, we know some people. Do you want one? (laughs) (laughs) Let me put a caveat to that. This is no, this is a good point. Let me put a caveat to that. I cannot help anyone who does not want to be helped. And that is the beautiful thing. By the time someone comes to me and they find me, they are like, I need like right now, Nicole, help me figure my shit out. It's not like, oh, can you convince me? I'm not sure. Like by the time they've gotten here, they're ready. And it's because they're so ready that they get results so fast because I'm not spending any time trying to convince them of anything. They're just more like, what do I do? Tell me what to do and I will do it. And that is the best because we can move mountains when that is their energetic state. Yeah, like the, like the old joke, the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> <laughs> A thousand percent. <laughs> so uh, one thing, you know, as I was, again, you know, doing, doing the, 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 the vast amount of research that I do, um, I, was, I was actually kind of fascinated by, by kind of the business model that you got set up. You've got, yeah. you've got the only fans, you know, for, for, yeah. for the adult content, and then you've got the, you know, the NicoleMitchell.com website. Yes. Which really is kind of geared more towards that, you know, life coaching, motivational speaking, you know, and, 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 and yeah. all the nice things. And, and then the very last one is the, the lingerie. So, <laughs> so what, what made you decide? I mean, you know, obviously the, 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 the only fans, you know, you went that route with that, but um, what made you decide to like split the two up, not just have a, a Nicole Mitchell mega site where you can have the live coaching if you click here but if you want to subscribe to you know this other side over here was it kind of wanting to make sure you kept those separate so you didn't get chocolate and the peanut butter type of a deal or (laughs) great question you know it kind of just happened instantly um because i created my i had my website created Actually, I had it created before I even had a business. It just kept, people kept telling me, Nicole, you're your own brand. You're your own brand. You need to put yourself out there. And I didn't even know what the fuck that even meant back then. But I hired a web designer, paid for a professional headshot, photo shoot, created this website just to put my name out there and hold space for whatever it's going to become. And then I started my life coaching business a little bit later and started adding that information to my website. And then OnlyFans has kind of evolved. Um, and it's more just laziness. Is the real answer. I didn't end up putting it on my website out of pure laziness, not at all from trying to keep it separate. Because if you go to my Facebook, if you go to my Instagram, it's all public about what I do. I'm very intentional about living a very integrated life Mm -hmm. um, and not having to separate anything. And I've thought about that. I'm like, I should probably put OnlyFans on my website. And that's as far as I get. And so this is probably a reminder to actually do that tonight. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we're just covering every base. This is great. <laughs> you are. I'm so appreciative. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, kind of continuing along with that, um, I'm assuming prior to the, 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 the COVID coronavirus pandemic, your, your life coaching was probably a lot more, you know, sit down face to face, you know, live interaction. Um, how much has, you know, the, 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 the epic saga known as 2020 changed how you've gone about your business? I mean, is it, is it a lot more, you know, zoom and Skype chats? Is it, you know, over the phone type stuff? Like how, how are you still maintaining the, the life code, we obviously know that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the only fans is pretty, pretty, we're pretty much good on that end, but on the life coaching yes. end, how, how has that changed due to the, the pandemic of the year? Yeah, great question. So my business wasn't affected at all. And in fact, it's only grown during 2020 because my business was completely online beforehand. And I, I designed it that way intentionally because I wanted location independence. I wanted to be able to run my business anywhere from around the world. I love to travel. I love being mobile. 
And so all my sessions are held via um, phone calls. So no video, just voice and all my courses are held online. And so that was a good, good thing um, that my business had already been fully online. So when 20 or when COVID did hit, there was no transitioning. I was already there and it was great because I was able to help a lot of my clients and other businesses learn how to transfer to an online business and teach them how to do it really well because I'd already been doing that for a couple of years. So I'm really grateful for that. And also again, about core beliefs, when COVID hit, something I challenged my clients with is, was the belief of what if in, instead of viewing this as the worst thing to happen to you, what if you viewed it from the lens or the question of what if this was the best thing to happen to you and approach it from that angle. And if COVID has no power over you, because I always tell my clients, you are the most powerful factor at play in your life. Nothing outside of you is more powerful than you. If, how do you want 2020 to go? And my clients have slayed 2020. They have doubled, tripled, quadrupled their income. They have hired employees. They have expanded their business. They're having the best love of their life. Like everything has improved through 2020 and it's across the board. So it's not just for one or two of my clients. So it just shows even collectively when people work with me, there is this belief we hold together that life only gets better and better for us no matter what. And even during COVID, that has proven true. Nice. That, that is amazing right there. Um, yeah. Have you given, given any thought? I mean, I don't know, you know where we go. I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we're now working on your apparel and merchandise empire. Have you given any That's consideration right. to, to branching out in any other, any other type of ways, fields, or means? Yes. Oh, I love that. Yes. I genuinely would love to create uh, merchandise. I, I'm asked about it all the time and I just, I haven't thought to like put energy and intention behind that, but I just hired a manager this week. And so I'm actually going to give her that task to look into that. <laughs> but one of my dreams is to uh, write a book at uh, many books, but start with one and tell my life story. And my dream then is to have my book turn into a film and have it be shared on a global scale in that way. So that's kind of the direction I see it going. Um, for my dreams, I've always loved TV. I've always loved film. I'm an actor. And so it'd be, and I'm a writer. So I love that I could write a story and then be able to watch it on the screen, maybe even act in it would be a very cool thing to experience. So that's kind of the direction I'm going. And my manager is helping with all kinds of other things. She has like a vision of me creating my own lingerie line with a couple of my favorite or one of my favorite lingerie companies. So we're in the the creative process for that. So it's been really cool to see like a bunch of bunch a bunch of new possibilities be born as a result of my story going viral and I am here for all of it. I'm here for the creativity, I'm here for the ideas, I'm here for the options and I'm just as curious of which ones we'll dive into and we'll take off as a result. And we're here for the first rights to interview when that movie comes out. Yeah. Okay. It's going to happen. Dibs. It's Dibs on happen. Nicole. <laughs> you heard it here first, kids. Um, yes, you did. <laughs> so, so then, you know, with that, with that being said, what, what <coughs> for, 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 for Nicole Mitchell looking in the mirror, what what's the end game? What what's your what's your end goal? Hmm. God, you guys, you're so good with questions. <laughs> I love this. I mean, this might sound more vague, but it's very true to my heart. I want to see how far I can go. I want to see how good my life can get. I want to see just what a breathtaking reality I can create. So I have a dream and a goal and it's going to fucking happen because we're talking to Nicole fucking Mitchell of being a billionaire. Because again, one of my core beliefs is anything is possible. There is no order of difficulty in miracles. There, it's no harder for one miracle to happen than for another. And so I teach my clients that like, it's no harder for the universe to deliver you $10,000 as it is to deliver you a million dollars. What are you available for? What do you feel worthy of? What do you feel safe in receiving? And so because I understand like a basic understanding of quantum physics and 
energy and what is possible. Like I literally have it on my vision board. I will be a billionaire. I will have books. I'll, you know, best-selling books. I'll have a film that will be a smashing hit. And from there, the world is, I mean, anything is possible. And a big, a big desire of mine is to become, you know, rich as possible, possible because I want to give so much money away. There are so many people I want to help. There are so many social causes I believe in. And in order to give a lot of money away, you got to make a lot of money. And so it's this whole journey has been me learning to give myself permission to become wealthy and to not associate wealth with greed or assholery or changing you into a bad thing and surrounding myself with really healthy, happy, successful, kind, rich people to show me that it's possible to be just that. Be the fullest version of Nicole, be massively rich and leave the world a better place as a result. Better words have never been spoken. So, you know, right. Little dreams. And now I want <laughs> a t-shirt. Philanthropist. She wants to be a modern day philanthropist. <laughs> Is that the word I'm looking for? That's, yes. that's oh, a brilliant 100%. word. Yes. Philanthropist. Yep. Like uh, Bill Gates. Yep. I want to be like Warren Buffett who gives his friends $50 billion. Like, hey, Bill Gates, here's $50 billion because I believe in you and your dreams so much. Go play with my money. Like that's the kind of wealth and status I want to have. If white men in power can do that, me as a biracial queer woman can do it too. And so I'm, I'm determined to do it A, because I want to, and B, to help pave the way for other people, especially those from marginalized communities, whether they're queer people, trans people, people of color, people with different disabilities, showing that if Nicole can do it, they can do it too. And then we can all just circulate the wealth around so everyone can have a better quality life. You know what 2020 needs? It needs a little bit more Nicole. <laughs> oh, thank you. See, and now after all this, I now I now want two t-shirts. I want the go unfuck yourself t-shirt and I want the Nicole fucking Mitchell t-shirt. Yes. See, we're we're you know Let's you you, do it. you don't you don't need to look any further. We got your merchandise. You, <laughs> we we we're your hook up here. I can I can line you I up. I love it. You take a look Let's at those shirts over at quadmproductions.com and, and you'll see we've got quality and I, I got a hookup for you. We'll talk after the interview. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. <laughs> um, before, before we get into the, the lightning round of questions. The, 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 the lightning round. I love the lightning round. He loves. Oh, he, Nicole's ready. He loves him some lightning round. <laughs> um, just, out of, just out of my own sheer uh, uh, curiosity here. Um, you, uh, biracial, what, what, what two races make up Nicole fucking Mitchell? Yes, love it. Uh, my dad is Caucasian and my mom is Korean. Oh, okay. All right. That's a good mix. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I look pretty white. <laughs> I've had people assume I'm adopted because my three brothers look pretty Asian. So that's always a comical moment. But yeah, <laughs> I am biracial. <laughs> That's that's okay. That's all right. Um, <laughs> well, let's go ahead then, and hit the, and hit Jason's favorite part of the part of the part of the Q and A session. It is. We've been hitting you with let's all the all it. the all the serious questions that make you like think and crap like that. So, <laughs> TJ, every interview we've done, we do this little lightning round thing of silly questions that don't mean anything, but are that might be funny. Okay. So are, are you ready it. to I'm answer some, some odd questions? Yes, bring Kay. it on. Okay. Um, we'll start with sock shoe, sock shoe, or sock, sock, shoe, shoe. Oh, God. Sock, sock, shoe, shoe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> took a lot of thought. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, you made mention of Warren Buffett. Uh, who's some? Who are some other people that you admire? That you admire, inspire, and say this is this is a blueprint for what I for what I want to achieve. Or yes. you just dig them. Oh my gosh, so, so many people: um, Prince, RuPaul, Janet Mock, Laverne Cox, and Oprah Winfrey. Like are like some of my people. I especially love Oprah because I love as a little black girl in Mississippi being raised by her grandma who's working for white people. And she's like five years old. Oprah's like five years old. And her grandma says, all right, honey, you're going to need to watch how I do this laundry because you're going to do this for white people someday. 
And at this little tender age with no exposure to anything outside of that reality, she thought, no, I'm not. That is not my future. I'm meant for more. And here she is today. And I think that's so true for all of us where there's something inside of us that knows what we're meant to do with our life. And at some point we have to choose, are we going to honor that knowing or are we going to do just what's expected of us? And just seeing Oprah defy all odds just shows me if she can do that, anything is possible. Yes, Jason, you can go now. (laughs) (laughs) So much lessons I just like dive deep, but keep going. (laughs) Okay. A little little calm during the storm. Don't worry about that. In the first few seconds, do you hope that it's ice, ice, baby, or under pressure? Ice, ice, baby. Huh. You're the first person to answer ice, ice, baby. (laughs) (laughs) I'll take that that title. Has anyone ever mistakenly booked you for an interview or a show thinking that you were a former uh, Jamaican gold medal sprinter, Nicole Mitchell? No, but I wouldn't be surprised if that happened. I Googled my name and I found that to be true about me. (laughs) That's funny. Okay. What do you find sexy? Oh my gosh. Two things. I mean, things. Someone who is fully living out their purpose, such a turn on, and someone who is confident, super sexy. Ooh, ooh. All right. <laughs> ranch or marinara? Say that again. Ranch or marinara? Marinara. Spicy. Marinara. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, many different art forms pictures, photography, painting, music. Um, what is your favorite? Music. Music? Yes. Who's your favorite music artist? Like nothing else. Go ahead. Who's your favorite music artist then? Okay. This is a little tricky. Um, I love all kinds of artists, but my favorite music to listen to, (laughs) you're going to laugh. If I Google it on YouTube, it's called Emotional Epic Music. And they're really intense emotional soundtracks that get me in the flow. And I create some of my best content when I'm listening to this really intense music and I, I feel unstoppable. I feel powerful. I feel like I'm going to conquer the world. So I listen to it pretty regularly. It's the uh, motivational speaker form of uh, lo-fi beats and hip hop for studying. <laughs> yes! Exactly. TJ had a confused look on his face. Like he didn't understand. <laughs> I, got, I got someone, I got, I got a video of someone doing dubstep with rubber chickens. If you want to watch that, that's pretty entertaining too. <laughs> Motivational content right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Uh, Nicole, are you a dog person or a cat person? Oh my gosh, that's a really hard question. <gasps> um, I grew up with a dog, never thought I was a cat person, but I have a cat now and she's like my little buddy. I would probably have to say a cat person. Cat person? We can understand that. We call that the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> So good. I'm glad I got, got that right. Okay. Going to sneak another one in here on you. Would you rather be caught lying or have people not believe you when you tell the truth? Oh my gosh. Have people not believe me telling the truth. Have people not believe you? Yep. It's a hard one. Yeah. That, I think that's, that's a brutal the, question. Yeah, it is. It's a tough question. And I think I, like having people not believe you is the right answer because at least you're not lying. Right. Yeah. And it also represents my life. Um, I think people can believe they come to me and like, whether it's my life coaching content, they think they think I'm crazy or they see my photos and they, they just assume I'm doing it for attention. So I'm used to being misunderstood, but I still live my truth every day. Okay. And speaking mm-hmm. of every day, like, Nicole goes to bed probably whenever the fuck she wants. Nicole wakes uh-huh. up in the morning. 
how does she start her day? What do you do? Do you get your Mr. Coffee going with a cup of Joe and <laughs> or what? Or I mean, everybody's got a routine. Yes. Yeah. I actually don't really drink coffee. Um, I always wanted to, cause I feel like that's like a marker of adulthood. So I feel like I've never fully reached adulthood because I don't really drink coffee. So I'm still working on that. Um, yeah, well, you can start up, off light by going rhythm. to Starbucks. What? You can start off light by going to Starbucks before you work your way into like full fledged like truck stop coffee. Oh you, you don't have to oh, like. <laughs> yes, I have to have lots of cream and sugar for you to drink coffee. This is true. <laughs> um, I have a rhythm uh, where I wake up and I take a few moments every day to get grounded. So whether I ask Alexa to turn on meditation music. I pick up a book. I always have a book on my night table. It's like a memoir or a motivational book. I'll read a paragraph or a page. Um, I'll read over some affirmations or I just sit there quietly and just remember who the fuck I am. Because I tell my clients, we kind of wake up with amnesia. We kind of forget who we are, even especially where, where we're going, who we're becoming. And so if you just spend a few moments in the morning remembering who you are and what you came here to do and how powerful you are, it changes the energy and the course of your day. So I spend probably about five minutes every morning getting grounded, getting centered, and then I get up and get going, and I feel like I just start off so powerful that way. And and to end the day, hold on, hold on. I, no, I got, I got up, one. TJ. I got one. Shut up, TJ. Okay. You've been talking a lot. Fine, fine. <laughs> You've been talking a lot. So you had your whole day. Now, <laughs> for dinner, you can pick anyone in history to have dinner with. Who is that? Oh my gosh. <gasps> oh my goodness. Okay, let me think. In history. Anyway. Wow. You know, it's so funny. Ever since I was a little girl, I've always wanted to sit down with a indigenous woman before the Europeans colonized the U.S. and ask what her experience and her story was. What was her life like before all that? So it'd probably be with someone like her. Wow. I've thought about having that. That's that's a weird thought, but cool. Yeah. I've often wondered that. <laughs> yeah. Like a random thing. Like it's not like a specific famous person, but I I just have such a heart for indigenous people and wondered what their life was like before it got ruined. Here in uh uh we live in Montana and it has a, a very rich uh history of the indigenous uh people and whatnot. Um there's a it goes back literally tens of thousands of years and it's all mm. over the place up here. And there is here in Montana, we even, I think it's five reservations. Oh, there's more than that. Mm. I think it's five. Yeah. And, uh, they're all really interesting. They're all really interesting places to go to. Yeah. yeah so much rich, rich history there. I'm going to go back to the shallow end of the pool with my next question. You do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll doggy paddle there we're with you. <laughs> we're, going, we're, going, we're, going an, we're going ankle deep on this one. Okay. Based on based on the previous question, which do you think is going to happen first? The same sex encounter or drinking a good cup of coffee? Oh. <laughs> we're playing oh, the God. odds. We're playing <laughs> the odds here. I'm which is going to happen big first? Of a Trust me, dude, you can just go to Starbucks and get <laughs> coffee. I mean, <laughs> There's no I place down it. there That's called so Star Fucks. <laughs> <laughs> there probably is. I will keep you posted. <laughs> I'm ready for it. <laughs> Welcome to Nicole Watch 2020. <laughs> yes. This I week, this it. week she winked at somebody. <laughs> She's making progress. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, do, so do, do you have any more? Or are we ready to wrap up with the grand finale question? I, I think we're ready for the 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 cap of the the put put the the fancy words on top of the thing. Yep. Question. This this is the one we ask. We, this is the key one that we ask all of our interviewees. Jason, if you would please, Nicole, what is your favorite dinosaur? My favorite dinosaur. Yeah. Your favorite dinosaur. Oh my gosh. I'm like the least educated on dinosaurs. But if I had to answer, what is the dinosaur with a really, really long neck from um, Land Before Time? Oh. The, not um, the Brontosaurus. It, it's one of those type of dinosaurs. I know she's talking about the yeah. long neck plant eaters. Right. 
Yes, because they're plant eaters and Land Before Time just made them look so tender and soft and such amazing dinosaurs that I would choose that one. Okay. <laughs> the, soft, the soft, tender dinosaur. That's the answer we're going to we're gonna go with. And we think it's awesome you picked a dinosaur. Yeah, the last the last one said the woolly mammoth. So you, you, you're you already ahead of the game on that one, kiddo. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, well, again, Nicole Mitchell, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, do, you yeah. got, do you got anything else you would love to kind of whore out to the kids as far as Facebook page, Instagram page? Anything you would yes. you'd, you'd like to direct folks to? Yes, please come follow me. I always engage with my comments with people who follow and message me. I just really value the community that I've built and would love to have you be part of it. You can find me at Facebook at Nicole with a K S Mitchell and on Instagram at Mitchell Nicole, M I T C H E L L N I K O L E. And from the two accounts, you'll find me anywhere. You can go to my website it has all my accounts, except for only fans working on that tonight, TJ and Jason. And <laughs> if I could leave with a message for you all, it is, you can absolutely trust yourself. And your desires are leading you to your destiny. And it is so, so worth it. So keep going. Boom. Boom. Well, thank you Boom. again. That's like that. better. Yeah, better words cannot be said. How, how can we end this other than thank other, you? <laughs> thank you. Um, you're a really awesome person, Nicole. Thank you for sharing your story. And uh, yeah. I, we wish, not I, but we wish you the best of luck. And uh, we hope to hear back from you. Thank you so much. I had a blast with you guys. You were awesome. Definitely. We'd love, we'd love to get you me. back on. You know, down, down the road here, we'd love to get you back on and hear some more tales. Yeah. Yes, I'll update you. That was so fun. <laughs> we'll want to know all the good stuff. Yes, <laughs> I'll coffee. save it for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and for all you guys out there, as always, uh, let's go ahead here and uh, 